Welcome to this forum for the Portage County Circuit Court Judge Branch, two candidates sponsored by the League of Women Voters of the Stevens Point area uh, and the Stevens Point area Senior High Student Senate. My name is Meg Erler. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of the Stevens Point area. I will serve as the moderator for this event. The League of Women Voters is a political but nonpartisan organization. The League's primary purpose is to encourage voting by registering voters, providing voter information, and advocating for voting rights. The Portage County Circuit Court is one of 72 courts in Wisconsin. This course is in the Ninth Judicial Branch, or Ninth Judicial District. The circuit courts are divided into branches. Each branch represents one judge. Each county has at least one judge. In Portage County, there are three branch judges. The Wisconsin Constitution confers the circuit courts with original jurisdiction in all matters civil and criminal, in addition to appellate jurisdiction as granted by the legislature. Limitations on the circuit court's ability to hear or judge a matter are couched in terms of restrictions on the court's competency to proceed. Some of the more common ways in which a circuit court exercises appellate jurisdiction are statutory and or certiorari appeals from the decisions of municipal governing bodies or state administrative agencies or appeals from municipal courts. To qualify for a judgeship in Wisconsin, a person must be licensed to practice law in Wisconsin for a minimum of five years immediately prior to election or appointment and be under the age of 70. Circuit court judges are elected to six-year terms in nonpartisan spring elections. As of January 4, 2022, Wisconsin circuit court judges earn 155000 $23 annually. We appreciate that the two candidates for this office are present, Louis Malepsky and Stephen Sawyer. In order to provide the most time to hear from the candidates and to provide a fair and equal opportunity to answer questions important to you in this community, I will review the format, time, and terms for this forum. This has also been reviewed with the candidates. Each candidate will have a first have two minutes to introduce themselves and make an opening statement. They will have one and a half minutes to respond to questions. They will also have one minute to make a closing statement. I will repeat the question when requested. Candidates will respond first to some questions submitted by the league and students from the SPASH Student Senate, and then questions from the audience. Questions from the audience must be addressed to both of the candidates. If you want to submit a question, please motion to one of the ushers for index cards and pencils. The League reserves the right to review and screen questions for relevance and to avoid duplication. The timers are located in front of the candidate tables. A green folder will be held up when their time starts. A yellow folder indicates 30 seconds remain, and the red folder means that time has expired. Candidates may finish their sentence, then please stop so the next candidate may begin their response. Candidates are asked to keep their remarks germane to the questions and fair to the participants. The moderator reserves the right to interrupt to ensure that these ground rules are observed. The order of response to each question will be rotated. We will alternate which, question, which candidate answers the question first. The order of the opening and closing statements will be chosen by random drawing of the candidates' names. As I've already stated, participating in tonight's forum are candidates Stephen Sawyer and Louis Malepsky. We now begin with a two-minute opening statement from each candidate. And we will have Louis Malepsky begin the opening statements. 
Thank you, Meg. And thank you to all of you, to the League, to the SPASH Student Senate, Stephen Swain community. My name is Louis Malupski. I'm the elected district attorney for Portage County. In my earliest memories as a child, I remember learning about the teaching profession from my mother and the legal profession from my father. College reinforced in me the ideals of public service at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Law school convinced me I would enter public service as a profession, and my job choices have followed my upbringing and educational background. I went to Marquette University. I was a mayoral assistant. I was a city attorney. I was a legislator for 10 years. I was, I was a private practice attorney for 11, and your district attorney for the past nine years. I want to be an energetic judge, ladies and gentlemen, so that I can work against cynicism in government. We must push back against cynicism. This is an honorable profession. A person elected judge must embody public service to their core and be ready to preserve the public trust in the office of judge. The public has put their trust in me for the past, well, since 2003, eight successful elections in a row. At each step of my service to this community in the state of Wisconsin, I've innately given myself to the people and their issues that have come before me. This has been an honor. I'm ready to be your judge to preserve public confidence in the courts and to use my legal skills and life experience to fairly and impartially decide matters before me. I'm ready to be your judge. I'm running for my kids, your kids, and all the children of Portage County. I'm ready to make tough choices, ready to treat people with dignity, fairness, and impartiality. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe it's our responsibility to be involved in our community and leave it in a better place than what you received it. I'm ready to be your judge for Portage County. And Stephen Sawyer. Thank you, Meg. Um, thank you to the members of the League of Women Voters, members of the Student Senate, members of the community, fellow candidates, government officials, and citizens. My name is Stephen Sawyer, and I am running for Portage County Judge. I'm doing so out of a sense of duty and out of an interest in serving this community. I've made my life out of serving my country and my community, and I believe that I've got the qualifications, experience, and integrity to do the job well. I'm an honors graduate of the University of Notre Dame Law School. I spent five and a half years doing international corporate finance work and financial institutions law. I served for a year and a half in the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office, gaining a great deal of trial experience in a very short period of time in a fast-paced legal environment. I've spent the balance of my 26 years in law as a criminal defense attorney practicing around the state. I have practiced and handled cases in 30 or more courthouses in the state of Wisconsin. That's a wide range of experience that has given me exposure to all sorts of judges, those who have exhibited great qualities and those who have exhibited qualities that I want to make sure I do not adopt as your next judge. I think that that experience and the integrity and leadership that I accumulated in my eight and a half years in active duty with the Navy as an officer and helicopter pilot have given me the strength to make the hard decisions. It has also exposed me to people from all over the country and from all walks of life. Thank you. So we will now move on to the first league question. We will begin with Louis Malepski. And the first question we have, again, each candidate will have one and a half minutes to answer each question. And feel free to in, ask me to repeat the question. Um, so what is your judicial philosophy and how would it guide your role as a judge? As district attorney, I currently work in a quasi-judicial capacity. In one sense, I'm already acting and working as a judge. I have the great responsibility to treat people with dignity, fairness, and respect. But at the same time, I have the 
responsibility to make sure that their constitutional rights are afforded to them. I do that when I see if a defense attorney is being deficient. I bring, the, bring that to their attention and ultimately to the court. I've had to do that recently where a defense attorney unfortunately was not uh, minding their case and also appearing on the record potentially intoxicated. I take that responsibility very seriously and I did it in a way to not impugn the integrity of that attorney or to affect the case. My judicial philosophy is to know the case. My judicial philosophy is to know the law. And at the end of the day, to be the person that is in the position to make the best decision based on the facts, the rule of law, the statutes. A judge makes decisions in an unbiased fashion. Even if you do not like the decision you have to make, sometimes that is what you have to do. My philosophy and my commitment to this county is that I will treat you with respect. You may not be happy with this decision, but you'll be happy knowing that I treated you fairly, impartially, and I knew everything about the case. Thank you. And Steve Sawyer. Thank you. The Supreme Court rules on judicial ethics start with a preamble that says our legal system is based on the principle that an independent, fair, and competent judiciary will interpret and apply the laws that govern us. I like to stress the idea that it uses the word independent, and it uses that word first. And it does so because that is a bedrock principle upon which our country's judiciary is founded. Independence is extremely important to this job. Alexander Hamilton in Federalist Paper 78 said that the complete independence of our judiciary is absolutely necessary in a limited constitution. That independence is what has driven my candidacy for judge. It has led me to talk to people from all spectrums in politics and explain to them that I am not a member of your party, I am not a member of your political organization, I respect what you're doing and I respect you and I will listen to your point of view, something that every unbiased judge needs to be able to do. And that's something that I promise you I will do. That is my judicial philosophy. The second question from the league, and we will start with Stephen Sawyer. What in your professional and community experience will assist you in working with people from diverse backgrounds who will come before you in court? I think the first thing that um, allows me to be able to say that I can treat each person with dignity and respect is my service in the military. I, I served for eight and a half years on active duty as a naval officer and helicopter pilot, and I came into contact with people from all walks of life. Um, the military has traditionally been a melting pot and a place where ideas come to fruition in our society. Um, the military was really the first institution in our government that became fully integrated. And working alongside people of all races, all creeds, all religions, all sorts of different backgrounds, I think was an important thing uh, in my experience to allow me to say that I can do that. I think also uh, 26 years of legal experience that's well-rounded, uh, legal education uh, that is um, top-notch, and my service to the community. Uh, Pro Bono Honor Society from the State Bar 2015, uh, also service on the board for the Portage County Legal Aid Society, uh, and that's just to name a few. I have also done a great deal of pro bono work for indigent, uh, veterans, and uh, disabled. Thank you. 
Louis Malepsky. Can you repeat the question? Yes. What in your professional and community experience will assist you in working with people from diverse backgrounds who will come before you in court? Thank you. Uh, I've had significant past and ongoing professional experience that will help me work with pe people with diverse backgrounds. And that's what really qualifies me and, and makes me the more experienced candidate in this race. I'm the only candidate, ladies and gentlemen, that has written as a legislator, defended, voted on, prosecuted, and executed the law. My opponent can't say that. I have 10 years of experience representing Portage County in the legislature, 10 years meeting thousands of you at your doorsteps, Republicans, Democrats, independents, who told me what they needed in the law, and I did that. I passed more legislation than any other legislator in the minority because I listened to my constituents and I worked with them. I worked in a private capacity with commercial developers in Stevens Point, several large buildings downtown. I drafted the legal work on that. I drafted the leases for my clients. I bought property. I've worked as a defense attorney to make sure people's rights are afforded to them. I've done adoptions, wills, states, many different types of law. And I've worked as your district attorney. I've worked managing thousands of cases. The cases that we just filed in my tenure, we've, we've filed approximately 10,000 cases. We manage 2,000 annually. I manage a budget of $1 million in, over a county and state budget. I manage 13 employees. In this race, the experience and the depth of experience, there is no contest. I have the most experience and ready to meet your needs in a diverse community. So question three is another league question, but then I will be adding an audience question um, for each of you uh, because it's related to this. What are your views, and we will start with Louis Malepsky. What are your views on alternative sentencing options and deferred prosecution programs where offenders are provided options for making restitution or doing community service in order to have their record expunged? And in which circumstances would you deem this an appropriate course of action for the court? I wholeheartedly endorse alternatives to traditional prosecution. And as judge, I would support the district attorney's office and the next district attorney if I'm elected of the, your next judge. By continuing the diversion program that I created in 2018 with the help of Brian Pyle. Ladies and gentlemen, prior to that, we did not have a professional diversion program. We've put almost 700 people through that program, saving you, the taxpayers, money to prosecute them, and saving that person the ability to have a second chance that they could be employed and get treated. We divert people by saying to them, if you voluntarily commit yourself to your alcoholism, your drug dependency, or some other affliction, we will give you a second chance. We will take a chance on you, and I can't tell you the success stories we've gotten. Hundreds. People have come up to us and thanked us. Just recently, with the help of Judge Egan, we converted a THC felony offense to a misdemeanor, and now that person can get a, w, a SB loan and is gonna hire two people which was the talk of the Portage County Business Council when I was just there. I support veteran courts. I support all different types of alternative courts as long as we can have the staffing to do so. Because we don't have a veteran court, we treat veterans in a way that helps their special situation. If they have PTSD, if they had a roadside bond blow up next to them, as your DA, we have treated them in a way that addresses their needs. And as your next judge, I'll work to individually work on people's cases fairly and impartially. Steve Sawyer. Thank you. I agree with much of what Mr. Malevsky has said. Um, let me at least give some credit to some people in the community that I think deserve it. Um, Justice Works is an organization that's been around for a long time and it was uh, put into place by the Honorable Fred Fleischauer, uh, the likes of Charles Fernandez, uh, the work that was done by people like the late Kurt Helmeniak. Um, 
diversion programs, deferred prosecution agreements, uh, volunteers and probation. These are all very successful programs. When the diversion program was brought into the district attorney's office, it was really brought in from Justice Works and uh, grant money that Justice Works then went to the district attorney's office to be able to do that. Uh, Justice Works struggled for a while when that grant money was taken away, but they have responded quite well. Um, I am very much for alternatives to sentencing, but I think there also has to be accountability. The staffing issues have to be sufficient such that we keep track of the people who are on these programs and make sure they're following the rules. The reason that that's important is because public safety depends on it. I think that these cases are appropriate for people who are nonviolent offenders and for people who follow the rules. A second chance is a great idea, but a third, fourth, fifth, sixth chance is not in the public interest. So the question that I was going to tag from the audience um, is something that Steve already responded to, um, so, but I will give you a chance to respond to it or to the, the original question. Can and I respond it, again? It is how willing, well, it's how willing are you if elected to reinforce the very successful Justice Works programs? And I believe you address that, and if you'd like to add maybe 30 seconds, and then we would allow Louis Malepsky to talk about that. Well, I, I think that Justice Works is, is an amazing program. Uh, some of the things that they do, particularly with people who are being released from prison, providing them with mentoring in the community to put in probably the two most important pieces to their staying out of trouble. And those are jobs, stable employment, and a residence where they are drug and alcohol free. These are things that Justice Works has been working on for, for many, many years and have been very successful at doing so. Louis Malepsky. When I was a legislator, I helped uh, in the underlying um, attempt to obtain the Justice Works money. And I did that with Senator uh, Dave Obey, and we ultimately got that money back to Portage County. And I'll tell you, when uh, I created the diversion program in Portage County, uh, we didn't uh, disband Justice Works or, or any of that money coming to the DA's office, as Steve indicated, that didn't happen. What happened was I worked with our county executive, Patty Dreyer, who is here. I told her what was happening at Justice Works. There was an issue, and we took care of it. And we did such in such a way that we gave Justice Works the opportunity to continue, and they did. And we give them adult mentors. Uh, we work with their adult mentors with our uh, defendants. And I believe in Justice Works as it did as a legislator and as a DA. And by bringing it into the DA's office, we've had strict accountability with strict standards. We have a probation agent working in our office, ex-agent, who runs that program. These are nonviolent offenders who are in the program by choice. They pay a fee to you, the taxpayers, so it's not a burden to you. And ultimately, they earn non-filing of charges or a dismissal. We don't have second, third, or fourth type of, of reoccurrences as what was intimated by uh, Mr. Sawyer. We have a one shot. Ultimately, I believe in the idea of diversion because your criminal code is about conforming conduct. And if we can conform conduct without bars of a prison, that's a good thing. And that's what the people of this county support. So the next question, we will start with Louis Malepsky. Currently, 17-year-olds are tried in adult court, yet current neuroscience research indicates full brain development does not occur until well after 18 years of age. Given this research, would you support legislation to bring 17-year-olds back into the juvenile justice system? Why or why not? I have supported legislation that brings uh, juveniles back into the system, the juvenile system, that is. Uh, I've worked on, as the president of the Wisconsin District Attorneys Association, where I represented over 400 criminal prosecutors before the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the Wisconsin Bar. 
I help draft and also uh, support legislation that would do the very thing, um, Meg, and to all of you. Uh, the criminal code, you should understand, allows in certain cases of original jurisdiction, for example, first degree intentional homicide, that original jurisdiction stands with these juveniles. They start in adult court. And there is a waiver process. And I have agreed to waive, under current law, some people back in some cases. Now, these weren't first degree intentional homicide cases. There were other lesser felonies. Because of the issue, as was dis discussed, which is some of the juveniles, the brain development, and you can see it right away, that the idea of putting them in, in with 30, 40 year olds who are hardened criminals is not in the interest of the criminal justice system. And what I've done when I prosecuted the wigwam bar armed robberies and other armed robberies by juveniles, we worked with them to the juvenile system. Some did go to Lincoln Hills. And ultimately, this was if, with consent of the victims. We worked with them to that type of disposition. Steve Sawyer. Thank you. I am definitely for the idea of moving the age back to 18 years old. Uh, some of that has to do with juvenile brain development. Some of it has to do with common sense. Um, currently, the law will look at uh, offenses between two 17-year-olds. They get into a fist fight, and they are treated as adults for, for purposes of criminal liability. And yet, as the victim, they're treated as a child. I think that we need to treat 17-year-olds and under as juveniles and 18-year-olds and older as adults. Now, I also understand that the law was brought into effect to take into consideration inner city gangs and the idea that uh, older gang members were putting up younger kids to go out and do the dirty work for the gang. Uh, there are certain crimes and certain situations where it's appropriate to treat a juvenile in the adult system. However, brain development, if you follow the science, uh, brains aren't completely developed until about age 22 or 23. Uh, it is still right to treat 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds as adults. They are adult people doing adult things and should be held, held accountable as adults. It's all about accountability and responsibility. Thank you. So we will have the next question for Steve Sawyer. We'll begin with you. I'm going to read you the, a league question. I'm also going to read you an audience question because they are similar. Okay. The league question is, opioid use is a serious issue in Portage County. How do you think the justice system could assist the community in addressing the issue? The audience question is, what are your thoughts on liberalized drug laws? How, as judges, can you use your power to decrease the harm of our criminalizing drug addiction? Those are both excellent questions. Um, first of all, I think that our court system right now, and, and Louie's been a part of this, is our drug court. Um, However, Louis is not the only person who's involved in drug court. There is a judge, there are law enforcement officials, there are members of the defense bar. Um, there are people in healthcare who are involved in this. Drug court is, is a very good way of taking people who are dealing with addiction issues, who are not out on the streets um, committing violent crimes, and who are not people who are continued repeat offenders uh, who are trying to use that system as a way to escape punishment. Um, drug addiction and particularly the opioid epidemic is, um, is something that has impacted our entire country. And it does require uh, our attention and inventive ways to deal with things. 
But that does not mean that drugs are not something that we still need to fight in this country because our children are susceptible. Um, and I think that we need educational programs, but continued use of the criminal justice system to provide not only incentives, but disincentives to people to, uh, who are bringing drugs into our community from other places and, um, and affecting our, our children and our young adults. Also increasing crime in our areas because of their drug use and their increasing need for money to support their drug habits. Louis Malepsky. And I think I heard the question, it's about what can the criminal justice system do that the judge oversees and what, uh, and also. So opioid use is a serious issue in Portage County. How do you think the justice system could assist the community in addressing the issue? And what are your thoughts on liberalized drug laws? How as judges can you use your power to decrease the harm of our criminalizing drug addiction? Well, first of all, um, opioids. There's a reason that there is a multi-billion dollar uh, nationwide lawsuit against uh, the various private families that made oxycodone, oxycontin, and other type of opioids that got a lot of your neighbors, friends, family uh, hooked and ultimately led to them seeking street drugs. I'm not saying everybody in here your family, but I'm saying in general. In the district attorney's office, it actually is quite a sad story. When we prosecute someone for possession of heroin, possession of fentanyl, and we go into their record through the pre-sentence investigation, they're saying, why are you doing this? And we learn that they had a knee injury, that they were given an opioid, that that opioid was taken away, and they had become addicted. And no one understood that, so they sought street drugs. And ultimately, as a judge, that's something, if that is given to me, that type of information, I will absolutely take that in consideration on the sentence, on what is appropriate for that person when they're sentenced. Do we throw the book at an addict? No. Do we throw the book at an addict when they've given, given a chance, a chance, a chance, and they harm someone, now they're driving and they kill someone? Yes. That's when progressive enforcement of the sentence is appropriate and the public demands it. I sit on a drug court. I drafted the policy manual for a drug court. I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem opioid use in our state. And I believe that we, that as a judge, that you have a tremendous obligation to protect the public relating to opioids. And as it relates to policy and the liberalization, I do s support addicts as the county just did, having needle exchanges and fentanyl test strips so that they don't go underground. I wanna keep people above ground. So our final question is a question from the league and we will start with Louis Malepsky. The postponement of court cases for 15 months during COVID has resulted in a sizable backlog of cases in the circuit courts. How do you intend to manage the backlog in circuit court two while giving each case the time and seriousness it deserves? Thank you. That's a very relevant question. Um, I'll say this. Right now as district attorney, I have one of the most important jobs that a government official has and busy. The, one of the biggest responsibilities of a judge is to manage the branch. I manage an office of 13 employees, a million dollar budget, about 2,000 matters annually. We're filing about 500 criminal cases, non-criminal cases. We have a lot of things going on and I manage all that, plus the diversion department and the victim witness office. I'm also on death review committees, child review committees, drug committees, all of that. So I'm already, ladies and gentlemen, dealing with the stress of a very important job. I instituted electronic filing in our office. I got rid of paper. As your next judge, I will continue the idea in the practice of modernizing the brands through electronic record keeping, working with our clerk of court who has already done the same, 
working with my JA that the county taxpayers provide me to make sure that we're on the same page so that we're working efficiently. In scheduling orders for the private bar that's here, I see Eric Sheets and other attorneys in the courtroom, Bob Jamboys is here, making sure that your orders are clear, that we're working on the same page, that I give you the opportunity to fire, file your motions so I can read them, read the law, and make a determination. I am extremely busy now, ladies and gentlemen. I have the time, I have the strength, I have the legal background to run the branch efficiently and to get the job done. Steve Sawyer. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to give credit to our former clerk of court and our judge in branch three, Trish Baker, for um, helping with the electronic filing system and bringing that to Portage County. Um, a lot of people involved in that, and I have to admit that originally I was um, dragged my feet, but I, I love the electronic filing system now. One of the things that judges have to do is uh, manage the calendar. Um, they also have to make sure that the cases that are before that court, that are assigned to that court, are efficiently moved through the system and resolved. Our former Chief Justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court used to say that uh, justice delayed is justice denied. There have been many cases during this pandemic that have languished in the system without a new court date for six to 12 months. Now, this is not something that the judges should have allowed, but these were things that happened within the district attorney's office. There were many cases that were set for a pretrial conference. Those pretrial conferences either didn't happen or something wasn't resolved, and then there was nothing put on the court calendar for six to 12 months. Now, this was a big problem, and this is a big problem that needs to be solved. It needs to be solved with strong leadership when hard decisions need to be made, when hard discussions need to be had. People with the leadership skills and the accountability, the people who are willing to say, this is my ship, I'm the captain of my ship, and this does not happen on my watch. So we will move into the closing statements. The closing statement is an opportunity for the candidates to comment on topics not covered in the questions. The order of the closing statements will be chosen by random drawing once again. Each candidate will have one minute to present a closing statement. So uh, Louis Malepski, your name is drawn for the first closing statement. Thank you. First to the league and to, the, uh, to all of you, thank you very much. Just to, as uh, getting into what my opponent just brought up relating to the district attorney's office, what you didn't hear, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason we had delay is because the defense counsels were not getting back to us. And we resolved that by working with the courts and ultimately getting the courts involved to get the defense counsels answering us. We also had situations where we had defense counsel die. So we had cases that could not get reassigned and, and worst is that we have a situation where we don't have enough defense attorneys in the state. And as judge, I'll work as hard as I can to make sure we have enough defense attorneys so that people don't sit in jail pending trial, waiting for a counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a district attorney that is very involved. I have been very involved in my job. I prosecuted Portage County's first bodyless homicide and only the fifth to ever go to trial and, and have a conviction. I prosecute only the, the hardest cases in the office and I've worked with everybody in the court system to make it a better place. I'm ready to be your judge. I can hit the ground running. I have the people's pulse. I know what they need. I've been to every village, town, and count and city in this county listening to what they need. And I believe that I have earned the right to be judge, but only if you go to the polls on April 5th and vote for me. Thank you. Steve Sawyer. Thank you. Uh, again, I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, the Plover Police Department for their perseverance, for their thoroughness, for their sifting through the evidence and documenting it all and taking the Cypher case that Louis just mentioned to the Attorney General's office. 
where it was charged. Uh, Assistant Attorney General Annie Jay took on the case, prosecuted it, allowed Mr. Malepsky to give an opening statement and to have a limited role in that case. She secured, along with the tireless help of the Plover Police Department, a conviction in that case. Now, Mr. Malepsky and Assistant Attorney General Annie Jay and the Plover de Police Department all share in that victory. And that was a victory for Portage County. But we need to make sure that we give the people credit where credit is due. That is something that I intend to bring to the job of Portage County Judge, is that integrity, the fact that I am accountable and I am responsible for the things that happen in my branch under my watch. And I will take responsibility for those, whether they're my fault or somebody else's. If they happen in my branch, they're on me. Thank you. Thank you to the candidates for the time and energy they have invested in running for the office of Portage County Circuit Court Judge Branch 2 and for participating in this forum. Feel free to stay to talk with constituents. On the April 5 ballot, Portage County voters will also be voting for several other offices, including Portage County Executive, Court of Appeals Judge District 4, Portage County Circuit Court Judge Branch 3, Portage County District Supervisors, Stevens Point Alderpersons, and Stevens Point Area Public School District School Board members. Also on the ballot is the Portage County Healthcare Center referendum. The League of Women Voters has a candidate guide for the Portage County judges' elections, which may be found at vote411.org. Myvote.wi.gov also provides information about the April 5 elections and the voting process. The League also has worked with local media to publish responses to League questions by County Board Supervisor candidates and Stevens Point Alderperson candidates. Some candidate responses have been published in both online and print versions. The others will be published in the next week. League contact information, including our website, email, and mailing address is available at the League table. This concludes the forum for the Portage County Circuit Court Judge Branch 2 position. Thank you, candidates and audience, for your participation and attention. We also wish to thank Seth Hendricks, who taped and will replay the forums on the site stevenspoint.com slash YouTube. These broadcasts are an appreciated service to the Portage County area citizens. Thank you to all the League members, and also thank you to the student senators who volunteered in various roles this evening to make the forum possible. We couldn't do it without all of them. And this is the first time that the League has partnered with the Student Senate, and hopefully it's the beginning of an ongoing partnership. Thank you to staff at Bren Franklin Junior High School for their assistance and for the use of this auditorium. The League believes that when you vote, you are participating in one of the most basic and important responsibilities you have as a citizen. When you vote, you are empowering your political voice. Please remember to vote on April 5th. Your vote does count. And now, let us show our appreciation to the candidates. Have a good evening.